In this training, you will learn the components and capabilities of a carrier-grade SD-WAN solution, what scenarios can benefit most from SD-WAN deployment, interoperability with existing MPLS and WAN solutions, the overall benefits of a differentiated SD-WAN service offering. So there really is a lot of ground to cover. We have a record attendance today. It looks like we have just over 400 people. Obviously, the marketplace is very excited about this product, and lots of people want to, to benefit from the training. A little uh, housekeeping point, because of the large number of people on the call today, we're going to be handling questions afterwards. So Daniel will ask at the end of his presentation for questions. The, this call is being muted, so if you could press star 6, it will unmute the call for you and uh, allow you to ask Daniel as many questions as you want to. So that's important to remember, star six. So having said that, um, again, you'll really enjoy and find this most interesting. I'd like to hand over to Daniel Lonstein, our CEO. Over to you, Daniel. OK, great. Thank you very much, Lenny. Uh, welcome, everyone. I hope you can uh, all hear me all right. I'm going to do this uh, fairly rapidly. Uh, I ran this training for our internal staff a week ago <clears throat> and ended up going for more than an hour and a half. Um, and I know that everyone's short on time. So we'll do the best we can. I'm going to move through it at a little bit of a rapid pace, but I will have time at the end for questions. Um, so I'm going to start with a little overview. Uh, I think we've all in the industry been hearing a lot about SD-WAN. Depending on what you've heard or who you've spoken to, it's, it's the best thing since sliced bread. It'll make you look 10 years younger. It'll help you lose weight, clear up acne, and uh, guarantee to make you more commission. So um, clearly, it, it, it can't be perfect for everybody. It has its uh, place, uh, which is, I think, going to grow over time. But at the same time, realistically, um, what I'm going to try and do in this presentation is show where it makes sense and where it doesn't make sense. Um, because, uh, you know, th there are both uh, scenarios. From the perspective of why I think Airspring um, is a great vendor for SD-WAN, clearly there, there are two sets of vendors. You can go to any of the SD-WAN vendors themselves. There's probably at least a dozen out there today. Uh, you can go to them directly and buy the hardware. You can also go to a number of other carriers like Airspring, AT&T, and uh, et cetera, who are offering SD-WAN solutions. I think where we uh, differentiate ourselves is our traditional model is to be a multi-vendor provider, which means you can come to Airspring. We don't only offer AT&T or Verizon or Sprint or you know any, any one carrier. You can go into our QuoteSpring tool, and today you can put in an address and get pretty much any available fiber vendor, uh, any available vendor of DS1, DS3, Sonnet-based services, and we recently added broadband. So we have pretty much all the cable companies, as well as DSL, Uverse, uh, Fios from Verizon, and others. So you can put in one quote with one address and get all of that information back with pricing in real time. And so our goal with SD-WAN is to do something a little similar. We're not offering 12 vendors. We are starting with two vendors for SD-WAN, uh, but we are planning to add more. And so again, we want to be that multi-vendor uh, solution, vendor agnostic, where our sales engineers can help you get on a call with the prospective client and really talk through the different options that we have available and why one might be better, whether it's pricing, features that they're looking for, integration, latency, other factors. You know, Every vendor does things a little bit differently. Um, and so hopefully we'll be able to walk you through with our sales engineers those, uh, those factors. OK, with that said, I'm going to jump into talking at a high level about SD-WAN. Building WAN networks has become very complex. OK, um, you know, people uh, talk about MPLS, frame relay, ATM, Ethernet, fiber, broadband, uh, private line, protocols, et cetera. So you know, SD-WAN really came about as a way to simplify WAN management and connectivity for larger scale enterprises who had very complex networks. Um, that said, it has a lot of other uh, applications today uh, besides just LAN management. Customers want connectivity and services to work 
perfectly, seamlessly, um, and that, for example, could be FaceTime, Skype, things where really a lot of the network plumbing, uh, details, uh, codecs, etc., have been removed and the user just gets a very simplified experience. SD-WAN stands for Software Defined WAN and using software cloud-based technologies to simplify delivery management and enablement of WAN services. I'm going to skip through some of these here. I want to talk about what's driving part of this. So we have huge demand for bandwidth uh, globally and certainly in the United States as well. So on the consumer side, which we don't deal with very much, streaming services clearly are driving bandwidth demand. Uh, things like Netflix, Hulu, Amazon Instant Video, YouTube, uh, on, online gaming, all that kind of stuff. On the enterprise side, uh, what's driving bandwidth demand uh, is all the cloud-based applications. So you have AWS, Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, all the Google apps, Office 365, OneDrive, Box, uh, you know, all the online storage and backup as well as uh, SaaS applications like Salesforce and things, and Zendesk, things like that. So on the enterprise side, we are seeing huge uh, bandwidth growth, and, and that's why many of our customers are continue to upgrade their bandwidth. What they could do uh, effectively with a one and a half meg circuit uh, some years ago, they now need you know 10, 20, 30, 50 meg circuits to be able to do all the stuff they need on the internet. So SD-WAN does allow you to quickly increase network capacity. That's one of the major things that it's used for. We'll go through in more detail later. Ideally, uh, SD-WAN, I shouldn't say ideally, but in many, in many cases, you can use uh, cheaper broadband internet access to uh, put together a higher quality network with diversity. Uh, SD-WAN also gives you centralized network management. We'll go into that in more detail later. So let's take a look at the four uh, basic services that people use SD-WAN for. And I'm going to go through these uh, in more details in the following slides. One is you want to run voice over public internet. You have some type of a VoIP service, whether it's uh, Cloud PBX, uh, Air PBX from Airspring, you're using Vonage Business, 8x8, Nextivo, or somebody else. You've got some kind of public internet, um, and you want to try and optimize uh, voice or video services. You put an SD-WAN box on there, it will do things to try and improve that. Number two, increase bandwidth by aggregating multiple failover links. Uh, number three, replacing an MPLS solution with a less expensive alternative that creates secure tunnels over the public internet. Or a hybrid network, and this we're seeing more and more requests for where people have an existing MPLS network, they want to grow or augment that existing network, and they want to do it by uh, adding diversity and lower cost uh, redundant links. and bonding them together using SD-WAN solutions. All right, so taking number one, optimizing performance of voice, other real-time applications on the public internet. This is just an example of MOS scores. Um, in this uh, little slide, you can see that on a traditional internet, 60% of uh, this <coughs> example calls had a MOS score or mean opinion score of uh, 3.6 or higher, which sounds pretty good. When you put it in an SD-WAN box, uh, that moved to like 99%. Again, uh, it's not the same as a managed connectivity solution that we would offer a customer where we guarantee the voice quality, uh, but it definitely will do a certain number of things to try and increase that voice quality and it will be much better in, in uh, most cases, although still subject to uh, the public internet that it's riding upon. Number two, increase your bandwidth by bonding WAN links. Okay, uh, here's an example. You have um, a customer with three separate links, uh, 10 meg fast E on fiber, uh, DS1, one and a half megs, and a broadband cable 10 megs down, two megs up. You put the SD-WAN box there, uh, you bond all of these together, and it will create a, a virtual single bonded pipe where you take the 10, the one and a half, and the other 10 down, you get an effective 21 and a half megs down, and 13 and a half links up by bonding these together. Not to mention the fact that you now have three separate links so that if one of them goes down, you still have two other links available for uh, service. Clearly, that is a more 
effective solution in terms of uh, reliability uh, and uh, you know diversity than just having a single 20 meg circuit. That said, in this example, uh, roughly half of your bandwidth is coming from broadband cable, which is not going to have the same standard of quality as a fast E circuit. But you could you could have two separate 10 meg fast E circuits from two separate vendors and use the SD WAN box to bond them together. So someone could say, well, isn't that the same as you know load balancing, uh, traditional load balancing using a router? It's similar, but it, it is not the same because load balancing is, is exactly what it says, load balancing. Here you're actually virtually bonding the two circuits together so they really appear as a single circuit, particularly when you use a cloud gateway or public gateway uh, proxy <coughs> to route all the traffic through, which most of our, our solutions do. So it's not the same as just load balancing two different circuits. Okay, three, we're talking about how to replace uh, an existing MPLS network. In this example, you have a hub and spoke network using SD-WAN. Essentially, here's your corporate office. You create a secure private tunnel to each of the branch offices, one, two, and three, uh, over the public internet. So all of these offices just have whatever public internet bandwidth they have, and you create uh, your MPLS replacement by the tunneling over the public internet. Now, in this case, it, you could say, well, I can do something similar with a router today. I can just create VPNs using my existing router. In this example, it wouldn't be that difficult. You'd have three VPN routes at your corporate um, VPN concentrator, and then it would go to each of these three separate offices. So yeah, in this example, not that complicated. But let's take a look at some more examples. Let's take a look at a circular tunneled network over the public internet. Now you've got four separate VPN uh, links going on that you have to manually maintain. And let's take a look at a mesh network, okay, in a, which SD-WAN can do just by plugging in the boxes. If you wanted to do this manually, you'd have to create separate um, links for each of these locations. So for each office, since it connects to three other offices, you basically have to have three VPN links for each location that you're maintaining. So it's three times four, so you've got 12 separate VPNs that you're maintaining in this example. Whereas using SD-WAN, you plug in the boxes, they uh, will go out on the internet and, um, uh, I forgot the word now, self, uh, they have a self-awareness of the other boxes on the network. Self-discover, I think, is the word, the other boxes, and immediately set up those links without having to manually code them uh, using you know, Cisco CLI or whatever it might be. As your network gets larger and larger, you can see that if you're trying to do this manually, which people have done traditionally where they didn't want to use MPLS, the number of uh, VPN links that you're having to create and maintain starts to grow exponentially. So for 20 branches, if you're trying to create a mesh network manually, not using MPLS and, and uh, not using SD-WAN, you have 190 separate links to, to maintain. If you get to 1,000 locations, let's say you have a company with 1,000 separate locations, you're at almost 500,000 VPN links. I, you know, I'm not that familiar with some of the boxes. I don't know what box you'd need to support 500,000 VPN links from each location to each location. That becomes unrealistic. In that case, you'd probably be just doing a hub and spoke. The advantage is with SD-WAN, you could take those 1,000 locations, send out one of these boxes to each location, plug it in, it would self-discover all the other boxes on the network, and you have a fully meshed network without using MPLS. That's where it starts to come into play. Even at 50 locations, you can see where the math starts to add up and just the management of what that would require. Okay, option number four, hybrid networks. MPLS with public internet. So here you can see we have a customer with an existing AirSpring MPLS network, and they are adding on some public internet for a remote office. They have secure tunnels from the remote office coming into uh, the gateways located in our core, which then translate that traffic over to the MPLS side of the network. So they're basically able to add, in this example, some remote or additional locations that maybe don't cost justify a full MPLS link and say, okay, we're just going to you know, throw on 
uh, an SD-WAN box. Now, we do offer a service today called VPN Extension, where you could uh, add an extended uh, VPN, but it's not going to have all the same features that a full uh, SD-WAN solution would. Another example of a hybrid network, you've got an existing AirSpring MPLS circuit, 10 megs down, 10 megs up, so it's fast D both ways. You now add an additional DIA fiber, 20 over 20. You add another broadband, 100 megs down, 5 megs up, and maybe a wireless uh, 4G LTE as well. Those now all get bonded in the SD-WAN box, and you've essentially upgraded to 130 down and 35 up on MPLS, the, the, the 4G you would use for major failover only, because otherwise it, it would get very expensive because you pay by the usage on uh, wireless. Uh, essentially, you've got now 130 down, 35 up with three separate circuits for your MPLS. And truthfully, even if your primary MPLS circuit went down, you can still route MPLS using the SD-WAN box using either of these other two circuits, including the broadband, because the way we set up the tunneling back to our core, it can replace the MPLS. Okay, so this is a, an augment or you know hybrid solution. Okay, getting into the three components of SD-WAN. Well, uh, you have the orchestrator, okay, which sits in our core. All right, pretty much orchestrates everything. That's why it's called an orchestrator. We have cloud gateways. Those are essentially proxies that allow all the traffic uh, to go through a gateway or proxy um, back to the customer's edge site and into our core, into and out of our core. And then you have the edge devices. Those are the boxes that you will plug in at uh, each individual branch office or office location uh, that uh, are the appliances that get plugged in there. So I'm going to give two examples here of how a customer could route traffic using SD-WAN. I'm going to start on what's called the <coughs> toilet bowl, excuse the language, but that is apparently the industry term. Toilet bowl is you have your edge device here. Let's pretend you have a DIA circuit plugged in there, whatever it might be. Any traffic that is just going to the public internet uh, that is not going to any of your core you know, MPLS or anything else, you just route to the public internet. That's called flushing it down the toilet. You route it out uh, right at the edge location. The only traffic that goes back to the cloud gateway would be traffic, let's say, designated, if you're using this as an MPLS replacement, designated uh, for going back to head office via your uh, core network. So that traffic would come back to the cloud gateway. All the other traffic would just route over the public internet from each edge location. Option number two is you route all traffic through the cloud gateway uh, so that everything goes through there, both inbound and outbound. And it essentially becomes a proxy for all traffic. In all of the pricing that we offer, we include the price of a public gateway. And in most cases, that will be our recommendation. In order to really um, leverage the benefits of SD-WAN, you do need to use the cloud gateway. I'll give you an example why. Let's say you're trying to improve the quality of, of VoIP traffic. You've got a PBX solution, cloud PBX. You want to improve the quality of that VoIP traffic over the public internet. Well, if you don't route it through the cloud gateway, what will happen is you can con the, the box, the, the SD-WAN box at the edge, can control uh, class of service on the upstream traffic, but the downstream traffic will have no QoS on it or class of service. If you send everything through the cloud gateway, the cloud gateway will control the QoS on the downstream as well, and that's how you're a really able to get an increase and an improvement in the quality of VoIP traffic while still using the public internet. So in most cases, we will recommend people to use the uh, cloud uh, public gateway. Again, uh, many vendors charge a, an extra price for that. We've built that into our pricing, so there is no um, additional cost to our customers for using uh, the cloud gateways. Some of the things that the SD-WAN solution will do is, uh, uh, I'm going to go through here, path steering. So here's an, an analogy. You have someone coming from downtown LA to our offices in Van Nuys. The shortest path, that's 18.1 miles, is actually got congestion on it. It's a congested pathway. It's going to take 40 minutes. 
you've got the next shortest path is 19 miles. That's got even more congestion. That's going to take 57 minutes. You've got the longest pathway, which is 21 and a half miles, but there's no congestion there. It's only going to be a 28-minute drive. In a similar analogous fashion, uh, using path steering, the SD-WAN solutions will constantly monitor all of the WAN links from a customer location. Assuming they've got multiple links, it will route the traffic on the path that has the best available option in terms of latency, jitter, uh, speed, etc. So it's doing continuous link and path quality monitoring on those multiple LAN links. links. Okay, application steering. This is going to optimize application performance. This I think of really as more like class of service, essentially. Uh, so the analogy is, you know, when you get on a flight, you know, they, they take maybe, you know, uh, people who need assistance first, followed by children, uh, families with small children, first class, and I'm somewhere normally down in group B or C at the back of the plane. So um, there is an order, there's a, there's a sequence to this. When you set this up, you can set up priority traffic. Clearly, your VoIP or real-time video traffic takes first priority. That will be the most important. That, they call that, they don't call it class of service, they call it application steering. It's essentially very similar to what we think of as traditional class of service or QoS. Load balancing on steroids, I've discussed that already. It's basically making multiple WAN networks and linking them together into a single virtual pipe with very granular controls and immediate failover between one. So it's not really failing over, it's actually routing in real time on multiple pipes uh, and doing packet validation to make sure that the packets are being received and if not, then resending those on another link. Okay, another question people have asked many times is, uh, do these boxes include a firewall? Now the answer is they do. All of the uh, SD-WAN boxes include a built-in firewall, and some of them have great, uh, pretty good, I should say, uh, feature sets. Having said that, it's not the same as, for example, the managed firewall solution that we offer with SonicWall. So this is a slide, actually, that has nothing to do with SD-WAN. This is a, a slide that we put together regarding our managed firewall solution, explaining if you went out and bought a SonicWall on the internet yourself, what you would get from that versus a managed uh, firewall, even if it's exactly the same box from Airspring. So when we're offering a managed firewall solution with managed security, uh, we're doing proactive monitoring, immediate response, updating of firmware. We're doing uh, off-site backup. Uh, a lot of features uh, in terms of support, uh, tech support, um, you know, hardware replacement, all these types of things that are included in our managed security option. So when you use one of these boxes as a firewall, uh, the customer will be responsible really for um, configuring that. Uh, as we know in the, in the firewall space, most people do not properly configure their firewalls uh, and so leave themselves open to vulnerabilities. So all of these boxes have a firewall built in. Uh, they can use it as a firewall, uh, but it doesn't have the same uh, management. And for example, with Dell, you know, they have their global um, global monitoring system where they're monitoring, you know, glo with SonicWall Dell. I, I think SonicWall is being split off from Dell, but uh, uh, with SonicWall, they they're monitoring, you know, global globally and updating in real time, uh, you know, on new viruses or threats. <clears throat> that is not necessarily the case when you use one of the built-in firewalls in uh, these SD-WAN boxes. So for now, we still recommend that people uh, have a fully managed firewall solution separate from the SD-WAN box now. If they're comfortable uh, configuring it themselves and managing it, and uh, they're fine with that, then they could go ahead and use this box as a firewall because it has uh, a lot of the same features. Okay, the other uh, important thing, it has centralized control of your entire WAN. So you know, when you look at this box, you can look here some screenshots. For example, here's a, a screenshot where they've got two links, AT&T and XO. <clears throat> it's tracking the throughput, the bandwidth, um, you know, bandwidth usage, what it's being used for, web, tunneling, media storage. Uh, 
this one, this particular one, as you can see, is using Jello Cloud, who is one of our vendors. Um, it's showing latency, jitter, packet loss, okay, uh, as well as again, you know, what they are being used for, total byte center seed. So you get a lot more visibility into what's happening on your WAN network, uh, and a lot of um, uh, control and management tools. Okay. All right. Let's talk about SD WAN technology versus other types of connectivity. So I'm going to start again on the right with MPLS, which I still consider to be the gold standard if you need private networking. So does it have true end-to-end -end QoS? Yes. On MPLS, you support multiple profiles for different applications. Is it affected by public internet congestion and breakdown? No. MPLS is a private network. So no matter what happens on the public internet, you're not affected by it. You can't really be hit, for the most part, with a denial of service attack because nobody can get to your network over the public internet. Is there a voice quality guarantee? Yes. All of your, because you have a QoS guarantee, as long as you mark your packets correctly for voice, you get voice quality. Do you get an SLA on data? Absolutely. AirSpring Managed Router Gateway is available for an extra monthly charge. All right. Now we go to AirSpring Managed Connectivity. End-to-end -end QoS? Yes. For real-time applications like VoIP uh, that we're offering, uh, you will get it. Is it affected by public internet congestion? To some degree, uh, we mitigate that because of QoS. But theoretically, if you had massive routing failures, uh, there's still a public IP there. You could be subject to a, a DDoS attack. So uh, it's not quite the same as a totally private MPLS network. Voice quality guarantee? Yes, for AirSpring Voice, we absolutely guarantee voice quality. Do you have an SLA for data? Absolutely. You have a written SLA. And managed router, when you have voice, we always include a managed voice gateway and router. SD-WAN, end-to-end QoS? No. Uh, you can get a similar to QoS by using the proxy. So you do get a, a version of QoS or class of service by using the proxy or cloud gateway. But there's no uh, SLA, and it's not true end-to-end -end QoS across all of the network. Uh, are you affected by public internet? Well, of course, to whatever degree uh, your circuits are. So if you're dealing with and, and this is very important when you're dealing with, uh, you know, broadband circuits that have no SLA and, you know, uh, they'll come out the next day to repair it. Well, then that's, that's what you get. So it's, it's and, and we talk about that down here. It, do you get a data SLA? It's not applicable because whatever connectivity type you have determines the SLA. So if you have Comcast cable modem, uh, that's the quality that you're going to get. Obviously, as you plug multiple separate circuits into a single SD-WAN box, you uh, effectively increase uh, your quality and uh, reliability, uh, and you're much less likely to be affected, but you are still theoretically at the risk of something happening there. Is there a voice quality guarantee? Uh, no. And do we include a router gateway? The AirSpring Managed SD-WAN CP is included. Um, it is a router uh, by itself. Um, and if you need AirSpring voice services, we would offer a voice gateway and add trend for an additional monthly charge. OK, what about DIA? End-to-end -end QoS? No, because uh, there's no QoS on straight DIA. Can you be affected by internet congestion? Yes. Is there a voice quality guarantee? No. Is there data SLA? Yes. On dedicated internet, you do get uh, an SLA. And we do charge and uh, offer uh, managed uh, routers for an extra monthly charge. Broadband internet. So now we're talking about AT&T Uverse, uh, FiOS and Verizon, you know, DSL, cable modem, uh, you know, all those sort of things. End-to-end -end QoS, no. Affected by public internet, yes. Voice quality guarantee, no. And there is no data SLA on any of the broadband services. No SLA at all. Um, again, uh, available for an extra charge. So we offer all of these services. And I think part of the AirSpring advantage is that we don't say one of these is the holy grail and is the right choice for everybody or even every location. We may have one customer who's using a combination of all of these at different locations. Um, and that's OK, because it's not one size fits all. I'd say AirSpring is the exact opposite of one size fits all. We're, we'd say one size fits no one but we can figure out the right size for you and your particular uh, uh, applications and your offices on a case-by-case -case and branch-by-branch, location-by-location basis. And we might recommend with our sales engineers a 
um, mix of different services that make sense for different offices and applications. Um, all right, let's talk about uh, some of the, what we call our battle card, customer situation, uh, once you use broadband or customer provided connectivity, CPC, get AirSpring Voice. Well, clearly, uh, we would still recommend AirSpring Managed Connectivity if you're going to get AirSpring Voice, but if you want to use uh, public internet, uh, throw in an SD-WAN box, it definitely will improve the quality of voice, particularly when we're using the cloud gateway, even on a single link, because we will effectively have some sort of a class of service or QoS. Security of MPLS, you want a lower cost solution, you can definitely use it as an alternative to MPLS, but again, it's not exactly the same as a truly private network. Um, it's, it's an alternative, uh, and if it makes sense price-wise, definitely a compelling alternative, but it isn't a private network, and it doesn't have end-to-end -end QoS. Existing AirSpring MPLS network, you want to add in remote sites. Yes, as I explained, you can uh, securely connect remote sites that are on the public internet or additional sites. Um, or you have an existing AirSpring MPLS, you want to augment and upgrade bandwidth. Again, we showed how you can add in additional broadband links to um, augment your MPLS network. Or you want failover links or failover. Again, um, this is uh, SD-WAN. Uh, really one of the, the great things SD-WAN does is allow you to add on additional links. Now, one difference here is we uh, offer, for example, today an AirSpring uh, managed failover service where I think if you get all the circuits from AirSpring, you get two different circuits. I don't even think we charge for that failover. But one is going to be primary and one's going to be secondary sitting there in case of a failover. In the case of SD-WAN, you're actively using both circuits. So if you have a 20 meg primary and a you know, 5 meg backup, uh, with SD-WAN, you're using and getting the value out of all 25 megs all the time, whereas in a failover uh, scenario, the 5 meg circuit is sitting there effectively on standby, unutilized, unless there's a fa failure of the primary circuit. All right, uh, this relates to how it gets priced, uh, and I'll explain you take the bandwidth of all WAN links in all directions. So if you've got a link that's a FASTE50, Effectively, that means 50 down and 50 up. The total bandwidth is up to 100 megs. If you had a 20 down and 5 up, your total bandwidth for purposes of sizing an SD-WAN box is 25 megs. If you have two links here, a uh, 50, 50 meg circuit uh, with a uh, 20 down, 5 up, and another fast E50, um, effectively, you get 20 down altogether, and then the 5 and the 50 up, so you'd be at 70 plus 55, 125 megs. So you have to add in both directions. Now, people have mentioned, okay, let's just, let's just take a simple example here. You've got a customer who's got a, a 50 meg fast E, 50 down, 50 up, that's 100 megs. Do I have to get the 100 meg box? Because realistically, how, what percentage of the time are they maxing out their bandwidth in both directions? And clearly, that very seldom happens. Certainly, even if people are getting close to maxing down their, maxing out their downstream, that most people are very seldom maxing out their upstream. So, uh, a 50 over 50, they may not need a 100 meg box. Um, somebody like this has got 25. You know, they may they may not need. This customer has got 125. They might be fine with 100 meg box because you assume that they're never maxing out their bandwidth, and you. Uh, price it based on the bandwidth at each individual location. AirSpring SD-WAN Advantage. So before I go over this slide, I just want to talk about we have two vendors that we are using uh, for SD-WAN. I believe the price sheets are now available on the Agent Star portal. We are using uh, VeloCloud, who's uh, quite well known in the industry, and we're using another vendor by the name of Mushroom Networks. Uh, we probably will add more, but we're using those uh, for now. Um, and want to give some various options to uh, agents and our customers. Again, why we think uh, we're a better way to do this versus going direct or using another vendor, we do that custom fit. Uh, we are not one size fits all. We're transparent, vendor agnostic. We hope to add more vendors. It's fully integrated into our uh, voice, cloud, and MPLS networks, uh, our 24 by 7 proactive network monitoring and reporting. 